uh, the slides, okay? And hopefully by that, uh, you will really digest the material uh, very well. And probably you're gonna come up with more question uh, in your mind and trying to uh, answer it. Okay, so in the I think it's the time uh, to start uh, the lecture. Uh, okay, so the first lecture we're gonna talk about is pneumonia and pleural effusion analysis. I think it's the easiest uh, one and it's still related uh, to the management and then we'll go over the interpretation. And please, if you have any question, uh, you can put it uh, in the uh, chat or uh, you can say, I would like to uh, ask the question verbally. Uh, so, Akhuna, uh, the uh, host, Akhuna Paris, I think that Paris, Adel, Adel Shamri, uh, will be uh, uh, giving you uh, the mic. Okay, so, of course, each lecture uh, it's have objectives. Uh, so go always over the objectives uh, before uh, the thorough uh, readings uh, after uh, the uh, uh, lecture, as well as uh, before uh, the exam, okay? Okay, so why pneumonia is serious? And I'm just trying to find a nice spot for this so I can still see uh, the chat if anyone have any questions. So is pneumonia serious? Absolutely. The pneumonia is the second leading cause of hospitalization in the state. And believe me, we are not far away from that. Unfortunately, we don't have as good data as the state because they keep record for everything. Uh, but uh, working in an academic hospital in general medicine, most of the admissions uh, are whether pneumonia or UTI. Those are actually compromising a lot of the general medicine uh, admission. And the, the sixth leading cause of death in the state uh, back in 2011. So it is a very serious uh, disease, okay? So, so in medicine, we always talk about lower respiratory and pleural uh, disease because we see them in hospital uh, frequently. And just to remind you about the upper airway, uh, and the, the trachea and then the bronchus and go all the way to the small alveoli, okay? And we'll take different kind of lower respiratory infection and each will have a certain uh, name and certain uh, pathology. For example, pneumonia is basically an infection of the alveoli, whether it's viral or bacterial, okay? So it can be viral, it can be uh, bacterial. While pneumonitis, it's again, it's an inflammation in the alveoli, but it's usually immune uh, mediated, okay? Oh, man. Okay. okay, my apology guys. I don't know what to do with those uh, chats. Okay, while bronchitis, it's an inflammation of the bronchi, okay? So it's the bronchi, it's not the alveoli, it's a bronchi. And you can see this mucusy looking material blocking uh, the bronchi. And usually when it's compromising the airway, you will hear the wheezing uh, out of it, okay? And it can be immune mediated, but it can be infectious. And most of the infectious in this uh, bronchitis is uh, viral, but it can be a bacteria, okay? Okay. Bronchiolitis, which is really a pediatric uh, uh, disease, is the inflammation of the bronchioles. So the bronchioles are the branch uh, from uh, the bronchus, okay? And usually it's inflammation. Uh, most of the time it's viral, but again, it can be a bacterial. And most of the time, actually, even if it is bacterial, usually it was preceded by a viral uh, infection, okay? Okay, how about the pleura? Okay, you guys see the pleura here? So in pyema, it's basically a fluid outside the alveoli, okay? It's very purulent. That's meaning, purulence meaning it's whether it's very creamy looking, okay? Or that's meaning when you send it to the microbiology lab, it will grow a bacteria. So, in a normal individual, 
the pleural cavity containing some fluid, but this fluid is absolutely sterile, okay? But in pyema, this fluid get infected. So you will have uh, a bacteria in uh, the pleural fluid, which can have its own very bad uh, complication, okay? Abscess, abscess is anywhere in the body, but when it comes to the lungs, it can be a collection of pus. So it's contained collection of, of blood, okay? But the abscess really can be anywhere in the body. So what's special about the abscess and the lung? Usually we don't have, or it's not advised to drain it unless it's causing a big trouble, okay? So we usually give them a long course of antibiotic. The reason when we drain it, it may lead to a complication like fistula, okay? Okay, any question, guys? Any question about the lower respiratory tract infection and diseases and pleural disease? Okay, so pneumonia, which is the main topic uh, today, it's basically microbes uh, in the uh, airway, okay? But usually to reach this stage of pneumonia, you will have a multiple natural barrier being broken, okay? So in our body, because we are breathing the air, so we need a kind of filtering system to fight the organism already existed uh, in the services and in the uh, air. So what are those mechanisms? Well, one of which is the mucus. So the mucus is basically the bacteria and the virus and the other bugs are basically get stuck to this mucus. So it doesn't go inside the cells and inside the body. What else? Well, the ciliary clearance. This mucus, this, the, the ciliary, those uh, spikes basically pushing out the mucus till it reaches the mouth and you can actually uh, throw it uh, out, okay? Also, there is an immune surveillance. So this layers, outside layers uh, of the uh, lung, it have a lot of immune-mediated uh, systems, okay? IgG, IgE, eosinophil, those are surveilling the area looking for any infection it can uh, fight, as well as the epithelial barrier itself, like the one we have in the skin, we have it also in our respiratory, sim uh, uh, respiratory system, so it can act as a barrier. Also, don't forget the IgA and the surfactant uh, protein, okay? So, to have a pneumonia, usually at least one of those gonna be broken so it's an opportunity for the infection to go inside the respiratory system. Okay, so uh, just to remind everyone about the sign and symptoms, we really, in the sixth year, we have to talk about an investigation and management more often, but it's never gonna harm to go over the symptoms again. So when it comes to the symptoms, you are talking about fever, shortness of breath, productive cough, people sometimes, especially elderly, will come with confusion and possible uh, hemoptysis. What are the signs? Well, fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension. They can be confusing examination. You will have a dullness to percussion, decreased breath sound, crackles, or uh, ronchi. And you guys have this in the fifth year, I'm sure about it. Okay, so what are the complications of pneumonia? So pneumonia can be simple, but sometimes it can be complicated, okay? So in the pleural effusion, you may end up having an inflammation uh, leads to oxidation of the fluid into the pleural space, okay? And we have two main types, okay? We have a simple baronemonic effusion, that's one type, and the second is the empyema. The main difference in the empyema, we, we can grow a bacteria and the fluids coming from the uh, pleural uh, space. Well, in the baron pneumonic effusion, it's just an inflammation of fluid, okay? Okay, so what are the types of pneumonia? I think in the fifth year, you guys have it's very simple, uh, which is the community and the hospital, but things are more complicated, really. 
So for example, in the community, we have the simple community acquired pneumonia with its two types, the typical and the atypical. And then we have the endemic uh, community uh, infection like tuberculosis, for example, and the other uh, histoplasmosis or plastomysosis. And we also have the aspiration. So we usually aspirate the bacteria in our uh, mouth or in our uh, gut, which are usually anaerobics or streptococcus. The hospital, well, we still have aspiration in hospital, also hospital acquired pneumonia, which usually a resistance uh, bugs. Also, we have what we call it ventilation associated pneumonia, which happen in the ICU. Okay. So our focus today going to be in the cap, okay? Typical and atypical types. So what are the difference? Well, in typical pneumonia, usually it's acute, accompanied by fever, chills, productive cough. They usually have a, a pleural a pain, and usually the physical signs will be positive. The dullness in percussion, the ronchi, usually they are exist, okay? And usually it's lower consolidation. So you see in this chest X-ray, you can actually outline uh, the consolidation inside the lungs. The organism, well, stripped pneumonia, it's the common one, uh, uh, hemophilus influenza, as well as gram-negative uh, bacillus and anaerobics. Those are the organism can cause typical pneumonia. How about the atypical? Well, the atypical usually it's subacute. So instead of being there for and in one to two days, it can be from five days up to two weeks, okay? The fever, usually it's low-grade fever, okay? Usually they will have non-productive cough, so there is no sputum. And the physical signs can be negative. And you cannot appreciate in the chest X-ray occasionally a clear-cut consolidation to say, hey, oh, this is the one. Here you see it here, you see it there, you see it here. So it's all, all over the lungs. What are the usual suspects? Well, mycoplasma pneumonia, uh, chlamydia pneumonia uh, are the common one in our uh, community. Okay. Someone asked about the ARDS. Well, ARDS, it's not a kind of pneumonia, uh, but usually it's an inflammation uh, uh, in the lungs. And it's one of the complications of pneumonia. So it's the immune response to the pneumonia can cause ARDS, okay? Good question, okay. So how do we treat community acquired pneumonia? We're gonna spend a good time in this slide because this course is supposed to be focusing in the diagnosis and in the treatment, okay? So different individual will choose different antimicrobial coverage. And the reason they sometimes can be high risk. So if you have someone very well, otherwise healthy, no comorbidities, you are seeing them in an outpatient setting, so they are very well, they just have a mild pneumonia. Well, microlide azithromycin can be a good choice, okay? And don't forget those microlides will have both. They will cover the typical and the atypical. The problem with the uh, typical uh, pneumonia, they can get resistance. So the streptococcus pneumonia, those kind of uh, agents, they sometimes can be resistant to azithromycin. So they may not respond well to azithromycin while those Organism for the atypical, usually they respond well to the azithromycin and the microlite engine, okay? If they have allergy to azithromycin or they have QT prolongation, doxycycline will be a reasonable uh, choice, okay? But let's say you are living in a, an area they have high significant microlite resistance, so it makes sense not to use uh, this agent. So in that situation, you will use beta-lactam like amoxicillin plus microlite. So the microlite is for the atypical uh, coverage or alternatively you can use respiratory 
fluoroquinolol, for example, moxifloxacin or levofloxacin, because it will have both coverage for typical and atypical, okay? How about for inpatient? Let's say you have someone in the emergency uh, department coming with hypoxia, so they need to be hospitalized. We usually assume the worst, so we don't give them only macrolides. We usually give them macrolide plus beta-lactam, something like ceftriaxone or respiratory fluoroquinolol uh, like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, okay? So when we see someone in the emergency or the inpatient, we usually are aggressive. So we give them, we assume there is a resistance for microlite and we give them uh, beta-lactam. Any question, guys? Okay. So we talked about the complication of pneumonia. Uh, and this is just an example. You guys see this whitening, uh, compromising the right lower uh, lobe and the right lung. This is all a fluid. And how can you confirm this is actually fluid? This is not a very bad pneumonia. Uh, can anyone uh, place in the chat? How can we confirm this whitening, this opacification it's actually a fluid, not a bad consolidation. This lecture should be interactive, guys. I need some answers. Are you guys here or am I talking to myself? Okay, so someone suggested thoracosynthesis. Sure, so if you do the thoracosynthesis, you will see pleural effusion. Okay, that's fair, but don't forget, not all paranemonic effusion needs thoracosynthesis, but this is one of the way, okay. But what else, how can we confirm? Before proceeding with the procedure, we need to confirm this is actually a fluid. It's going to be oxidative, yeah? But how can we confirm the presence of fluid? Someone said US, and I'm assuming this is ultrasound. That's a good thought, actually. So ultrasound, you will see the fluid as black. Physical examination, that's a good thought. So how can you differentiate in physical examination between consolidation, pneumonia, and pleural effusion? Someone mentioned dullness. Well, they both gonna be dull. Okay, someone mentioned the CT. Yes, CT should uh, differentiate between the two. Okay, in the base, let's say this is uh, let's say this is uh, pneumonia in the right lower loop. So it's in the same place of the effusion. Asymmetric expansion, it would happen with both. Okay, I will tell you guys, the dullness of pleural effusion is different than the dullness. Yes, someone already mentioned it. The dullness in pleural effusion, it's really stony dullness. Okay, it's like basically you are percussing over a stone while the dullness uh, with the pneumonia, with the consolidation, it's gonna, just gonna be done. So please get familiar with both sounds. Uh, in YouTube, uh, there is a couple of good videos actually to hear the difference in the sound between the two. The alternative, you can do a bedside ultrasound. That's a good uh, choice, as well as uh, CT. The fourth, probably, way is to do what we call it decubitus chest x-ray. So instead of doing the chest x-ray while someone is sitting, we do it while they are in their side because the fluid should move and the decubitus uh, chest uh, x-ray, okay? Are you guys following? 
So one, Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. So now let's talk about the tiles of pleural effusion. And someone among you already mentioned the transudative and the exudative. And uh, I'm just going to put this here kindly. Okay. So the two types of pleural effusion are transudative and exudative. Okay. And you can imagine that the exudative basically because we have an increase in the hydrostatic pressure, there is actually a leakage of the fluid, which is like a, a water uh, from uh, the uh, vessels, okay? So what you're gonna end up having, it's really low protein and low LDH because it's mostly actually fluid. When does this happen? Well, with cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, can happen with PE or with low uh, albumin, okay? Compare this to oxidative, when you're gonna have actually an inflammation in the vessels, okay? So this will increase the capillary uh, permeability. That's meaning all things in the blood can actually leak toward uh, the pleural space. That will contain fluid, but also protein as well as LDH. So you will have high protein in LDH, okay? This can happen with pneumonia, cancer, TB, infection, or autoimmune. Those all part of inflammation a process. While the heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic, there is no true inflammation, okay? And to be more objective, because high protein, it can be subjective, we do what we call it the LIGHTS criteria, okay? So if any of the following be met, even if one out of the three, we consider it oxidative, okay? So if you, if you take the pleural fluid protein, that's in the top, and then divide it by the serum protein, and it's more than 0.5, this is oxidative, okay? If you take the pleural fluid LDH and divide it by the serum, and it's more than 0.6, it is oxidative. If the pleural fluid LDH is more than two thirds of the upper normal limit of serum LDH, that actually an oxidative. And the last one, it's very simple. So without even knowing the serum one, if you have, let's say in your lab, the upper normal limit of LDH is 300. So if you have an LDH of 250 in the pleural fluid, that's exudative. Is this clear guys? Okay, if this is all clear, the cases will be very simple for you guys. Okay, so you have a 37, otherwise healthy, presented with one week history of shortness of breath, no other symptoms, okay? Examination revealed a temperature of 37.3, heart rate of 88, blood pressure of 115 over 75 with a risk rate of 80, saturation of 92%. He has decreased air entry to the right base with stony dullness. His chest X-ray showed this, okay? So you decided to do a diagnostic thoracosynthesis. What investigation from the fluid you are going to send it for? So the floor is yours, guys. So you do the thoracosynthesis. What shall we send the fluid for? Lights criteria, so boy, be more specific. I am the nurse with you. I'm asking you, what shall we send it for? Okay, cytology, good. What else?
culture, good. Chemistry, be more specific. So I'm the nurse. I don't know what chemistry means. So we already sent it to the cytology, culture, LDH, good. Protein, good. And don't forget, you have to send it from the serum as well as from the plural, okay? What else? So we send it for culture, LDH protein, cytology. Anything else? Cells, okay. So you're gonna send it for cell count, CBC, excellent. That I think good, good, okay. So always remember the four C's. So cell count, the CBC, cultures, including the gram stain. Don't forget the gram stain because the gram stain will be back in one to two hours. The culture may take days, okay? Chemistry, LDH protein, as well as cytology. I will add to the chemistry also glucose, ahsan Ali. Okay, okay. Now it's time for question, guys. What's your guys' question? No question? Gosh, nah. We need the lectures to be more interactive. All clear? Okay, okay. Okay, so let's regroup at 9.45, 9.45.